Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Well, we're on to another one of my favorite topics from the ancient world, uh, the rise of the Greeks. You know, uh, at a time when Mesopotamia and Egypt and, and China were already great civilizations, Europe was populated by <laughs> mostly uh, very uh, backward tribes um, some of whom were still hunter-gatherers, uh, huddling together in um, forest dwellings. Europe really came late to um, civilization, but um, it was this very dynamic people known as the Greeks that would um, really provide the spark for the beginnings of European uh, culture, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, like Egypt, um, in order to understand ancient Greece, you have to talk about the geography of that country. As you can see from the map here, um, Greece is surrounded on uh, three sides uh, by water, the Mediterranean Sea and the um, Aegean Sea to the east of Greece. And in fact, um, it is impossible anywhere in Greece to get farther than 42 miles from the seacoast. So um, it was almost predestined that the Greeks um, would become great sailors. And in fact, um, the, uh, the terrain, the, the, the lie of the land in Greece uh, helped to guarantee that because uh, Greece is a very mountainous country. The soil is very rocky and, and not very fertile. Um, there are really only two things that grow well in Greece, um, namely um, grapes and olives. Um, so the Greeks had lots of wine, they had lots of olive oil, but, but, but they really had a shortage of other types of um, food that they desperately um, needed. And so the Greeks had to use their sailing skills to um, explore the Mediterranean um, and the Aegean seas to make contacts with uh, other groups of people so that they could trade uh, their wine and their olive oil for uh, food. And so over time, the Greeks became great sailors, great uh, traders, great business people. And eventually they even started to establish um, what we call colonies around the Mediterranean world. In other words, um, people from different places in Greece would go out and um, uh, start towns and cities in other parts of the Mediterranean world. You see on the map in orange all of the uh, places that uh, the Greeks colonized. The great philosopher Plato said that the Greeks were like frogs around a pond. <laughs> In other words, it was like the Mediterranean was their pond and they were frogs sitting all around it with their various um, colonies that would ship uh, food back to the mother country. That was their um, purpose. But in the, in the process of colonizing the Mediterranean world, um, the Greeks spread their language and their religion and their culture um, to uh, many other places and in that way um, helped uh, to give again a spark to uh, the developing culture of Europe especially. The Greeks had a very very interesting political life um, as well. In fact that word uh, political <clears throat> comes from the Greek word polis which was what uh, the Greeks called their city-states. It was somewhat like Mesopotamia. In ancient Greece, um, uh, there were a number of different cities that were independent of each other. And in fact, each city was uh, its own little separate um, country. So they were called poleis, that's the plural of polis, um, which is translated as um, city-states. Uh, the fact that Greece was so mountainous helped all of these different city-states to maintain their independence because it was very hard to mount a successful attack over the um, rugged terrain of um, Greece. And also, um, you know, the cities were hilly and, and in, in each city there was usually um, a hill known as the Acropolis. And that is where um, the people would build fortifications. And if they were under attack by another city-state, the, the people would all go up onto their Acropolis 
and um, usually they would be able to successfully defend themselves. The most famous of the um, Acropolises in Greece is the one in Athens, and um, that was the site of the great temple uh, known as the Parthenon, um, uh, a temple to the goddess Athena. Uh, by the way, each city-state had its own special god or goddess, and so for the people of Athens, their goddess was uh, Athena, the goddess of um, wisdom. Uh, and that was very fitting because Athens would become a, a great center of philosophy uh, later on in its history. Um, also, as a part of each uh, city-state, you would have um, a, a sort of public square that was known as the Agora. The Agora was a marketplace. Um, it was where men went to do business and also to do political business, all um, political act uh, meetings and so forth. Uh, elections for the ones that the city states that had elections were held in the Agora. I say men because in ancient Greece, um, women were not allowed to go out of the house unless they were escorted by a man, um, unless they were veiled. It was somewhat like in, in certain strict Muslim countries today where women have to wear um, that garment called a burqa uh, that covers them nearly from uh, head to toe. In ancient Greece, women also were expected to veil themselves and to go out of the house in the company of um, a male um, escort. Um, so the Agora was a very male space, and it was the place where uh, political transactions um, took place. And there were several different kinds of political systems in the um, Greek cities. Uh, they were all listed out by Aristotle, um, another great Greek um, philosopher. By the way, it was Aristotle who, who first said that humanity, human beings, were political animals. <laughs> in other words, that um, human beings could not be happy unless they were part of a government, unless they existed in a political um, state as part of a community, that that was necessary for our um, happiness as human beings. And um, Aristotle listed um, the six different types of polis in ancient Greece, and he divided them into three good types of political systems and three bad types of political systems, in his opinion. So we'll go through all these. According to Aristotle, the very best political system was monarchy ruled by um, a king um, or queen, uh, but again, Greece was very male-dominated, so I think Aristotle would have probably said king. Um, he thought that this brought the most stability and wisdom into the government. Then, according to Aristotle, the second best form of government was aristocracy, government by members of certain noble families, aristocratic families, that had uh, titles of uh, nobility. Um, so later in European history, as we'll see in the Middle Ages, aristocrats would have titles like Duke or Count or Marquis um, and so forth, Prince. Um, so in, in aristocratic cities in Greece, there were a few noble families that, um, that ruled everything, that monopolized all of the public offices. The third best type of political system, Aristotle said, was the good type <laughs> of democracy. Um, and he meant democracy where the people had a say in the government, but also where there was a rule of law. Um, it wasn't every man for himself, um, where it was clear what uh, the expectations and duties were for the people and where people's rights were um, respected. So those were the three good types of uh, political system, according to Aristotle. But he believed that it was possible for each of those three to degenerate and become corrupted into its bad form. So if a monarchy became corrupt, it would become a tyranny ruled by a tyrant. Okay, so a tyrant, like a king, is a single ruler who rules over the people. But unlike a king, um, he wouldn't come from a royal family, and usually he would come to power with the help of the people. 
Um, so he was more like, a tyrant would be more like a modern day dictator, okay? Um, like like uh, someone like a Hitler or a Kim Jong-un, someone like that, who was not governing based on traditions like a king would, but simply to promote his own power or her own power. Um, Aristotle taught also that aristocracy ruled by noble families could degenerate and become oligarchy rule by rich people. Certain rich families taking over the society is called an oligarchy. There's actually been a lot of debate in recent years as to whether the United States is an oligarchy. You may have heard about this when people talk about how the one percent own everything and, the, and rule everything and the rest of us, the 99 percent, are left out. Well, if you believe that, then you might think that our system is an oligarchy. It's open to debate. But the very worst form of government, <clears throat> according to Aristotle, was the bad type of democracy, okay? And by this, Aristotle meant uh, essentially mob rule. When uh, you don't have the rule of law and order, uh, where armed gangs of ordinary people essentially take over uh, the government and uh, create a situation where nobody's rights are safe, um, where um, a mob essentially is in control and they're not governing according to any kind of good principles, but it's almost like a, a criminal gang taking over uh, the society. Um, and so we have seen instances in history where, um, where this sort of thing has happened. If you think about uh, France during the French, French Revolution in some of its phases, um, for instance, uh, if you've taken if you ever take world history too, you'll you'll uh, you'll learn about that. So, um, in any case, these are the six forms of government according to Aristotle, and political scientists still um, reference his work even today, talking about modern political uh, structures. All right, moving on, let's talk a little bit about how the Greeks saw the world, um, their ethics, their system of morality, their, their view of uh, human life. Well, um, essentially, if you were a Greek male, your life was spent in pursuit of what they called arete in the Greek language. That word means excellence. So whatever it was you did, you tried to be the most excellent in your field. You know, if you were a potter, you tried to be the best potter to make the most beautiful designs. If you were a weaver, you made the best um, clothing. Um, if you were a politician, you tried to give the most excellent speeches. If you were a warrior, you tried to be the bravest and the strongest. If you were an athlete, you wanted to be, um, you know, the goat, the greatest of all time, right? <laughs> so you spent your life in pursuit of excellence. However, <clears throat> um, the Greeks believed that you had to avoid going too far in that pursuit of excellence and spilling over into what they called hubris. Uh, we can translate this word as arrogance, pride, presumption, um, really thinking that you are the greatest and that you don't owe anything to anybody <laughs> um, and uh, that you're 10 foot tall and bulletproof essentially okay uh, and the Greeks told a little story about um, hubris this was the story of Icarus uh, now Icarus uh, and his father Daedalus were trapped in a very um, confusing maze on the island of Crete called uh, the Labyrinth. And so Daedalus was an inventor and uh, he decided to, to, to invent something that would help his son Icarus get out of the Labyrinth. And so he made a set of wings out of wax. Um, he gave them to his son Icarus and said, here Icarus, put these on and you can fly out of the Labyrinth and be free. But he warned Icarus, he said, son, Whatever you do, don't get too close to the chariot of the sun god Apollo. 
Uh, now, the Greeks believed the sun was actually a god named uh, Apollo who drove his chariot around the sky. Uh, and, of course, if Icarus, with his wax wings, got too close to Apollo, the wings would melt, and Icarus would crash into the sea, and uh, he would drown. So Daedalus warned him about that. Well, Icarus said, okay, Dad, you know, whatever, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm out of here, bye. You know, so he took off with his wax wings and flew out of the labyrinth. And for a while, it was great. You know, he was soaring, and he was free, and so forth. But then he got curious, you know, I want to get a little closer to Apollo. And so he violated his father's command, and he got too close to the sun god Apollo, and his wings melted, and he crashed into the sea and drowned. <laughs> and that, for the Greeks, was a story about the danger of hubris when you got too cocky you know too big for your britches they thought it always had disastrous consequences and so for the greeks their life was spent trying to find that balance you know between the pursuit of excellence and hubris uh, you know being excellent without um, crossing the line into um, into pride or arrogance um, the greeks were very committed to the pursuit of excellence, uh, and including in sport. The, the Greeks were crazy about athletics. Um, in fact, as I'm sure you know, um, the Olympic Games, the original Olympic Games, started in um, ancient Greece. As I'm recording this in 2021, uh, we've just finished the Tokyo, the delayed Tokyo Olympics because of, um, of COVID, the Summer Olympics. But um, the original Olympic Games were started in the city-state of Olympia in the year uh, 776 BC, and they were meant to be a religious festival sacred to the chief of the gods, um, Zeus. But they involved um, athletic competitions, of course. Um, some of the events in the ancient Olympic Games were similar to modern-day events, such as javelin and um, shot put and wrestling. They also had chariot races that were uh, very, very uh, popular. Uh, foot races, of course, uh, to what we would call track and field. However, they were different in, uh, in other ways. For one thing, all the competitors in the Greek Olympics were male, um, and uh, it, again, it was considered shameful for women to participate in them, primarily because uh, also this was the second major difference. All of the athletes competed um, totally nude. Uh, <laughs> this was just part of Greek athletics. Whenever you worked out, even if you were in public, you, uh, you always did so completely um, naked. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, and they, the, the, the Greeks would have considered it shameful for a woman um, to do that. Um, except for the Spartans. Uh, we'll have a reading a little later in the course that, that, that talks about this, but uh, most Greek city-states did not allow women to do that. Um, all right, what else about the Greek um, character? Well, the Greeks were great believer in, believers in fate or destiny. Uh, in other words, they believed that their whole lives essentially were mapped out even before um, they were born by three goddesses called the Fates, and um, essentially that your whole life was predetermined, and that there was really nothing that you could do to escape um, your fate. Um, there's a great uh, play that really brings this out very strongly. Some of you may have read it by um, Sophocles. Um, it's, uh, it was originally called Oedipus Tyrannos. It's often translated as Oedipus Rex or Oedipus the King. Um, so uh, in this uh, play, uh, Oedipus is being raised uh, by the king and queen of um, Corinth. Uh, and uh, he, as a young man, wants to find out more about his uh, future and his destiny. And so he does what any Greek would do in that situation. He visited the Oracle of Apollo at uh, the city of Delphi. Now the Oracle was a priestess of the god Apollo and people would come and ask her questions and she would go into this deep mystical trance and then she would wake up and come out with some 
very confusing <laughs> cryptic statement that you had to try to you know interpret what it meant well anyway um in the play oedipus goes to the oracle of apollo and she tells him you will marry your mother and kill your father <clears throat> well oedipus is horrified and he doesn't want this to happen so he says goodbye to the people he believes are his parents the king and queen of corinth and he sets out on the road to thebes uh, trying to escape his destiny. On the way to Thebes, he meets up with the king of Thebes on the road. They get into a fight. He kills him. Oedipus kills the king of Thebes. And then he goes to Thebes and marries the king's widow. Well, <laughs> as you probably have already guessed, it turns out that Oedipus had been adopted and that, in fact, his real parents were the king and queen of Thebes. And uh, so he had, in fact, fulfilled his destiny. He had killed his father, married his mother. And furthermore, uh, his attempt to escape his destiny had only made it happen faster. <laughs> and so the Greeks really believed that there was no way to escape your fate. And, and, and you might as well not even try to get out of it because you would only make things worse. All right, well, like I said, there were many city-states in ancient Greece. I wish we had time to talk about um, many more of them, but um, unfortunately we don't in this course. So I want to focus on the two most prominent and famous city-states, the first of which, of course, is Sparta. Now, Sparta has kind of become the object of much interest in recent years because of the two movies, the, the 300 movies, uh, the first one just called 300 and the second called 300 rise of an empire uh which i actually enjoyed quite a bit i mean of course they're not um really historically accurate but there are some nuggets of truth in them uh the spartans were in fact um renowned and famous for their military uh skill and and bravery they were definitely uh the most advanced uh, military state in ancient greece how did that come about? Well, um, Sparta is in um, the southern part of Greece, in the region called the Peloponnese. And um, next door to Sparta was another city called uh, Messenia. Well, between 730 and 710 BC, Sparta went to war against Messenia. They defeated the Messenians, and they enslaved all of the citizens of um, Messenia and they called their slaves uh, helots. Um, and however, there were actually more Messenians than there were Spartans. So it was very difficult for the Spartans to keep their slaves or helots under control. And so in order to do that, they had to really develop a very militaristic um, way of life. So in Sparta, uh, all young boys were sent away uh, at a very young age to military camp to train to become uh, Spartan warriors um, and essentially if you were an adult Spartan male freeborn that was your job your role um, in life but I won't go into great detail about that because you're going to read um, an excerpt from the Roman author Plutarch about uh, the laws of Lycurgus. Lycurgus was the great Spartan lawgiver who created their legal code around um, 675 um, BC. So you will learn more about that from the reading by Plutarch. Um, the Spartans did have uh, a very interesting political system. It was a very complex um, system. They had kings, actually two kings at any given time. But there was also a committee of ephors who were officers that were uh, strictly supposed to supervise the kings and make sure the two kings um, didn't get out of hand. Um, there was also a group called the Gerousia. In the reading by Plutarch, he calls it the Senate. Um, this was the Council of Elders, so the oldest and wisest uh, Spartan males were part of this um, Gerousia. And um, also there was a more popular assembly called the Equals. Uh, in which all adult Spartan males uh, participated. So it was really a very complex mixed system of um, government. 
And it's no accident, you know, in later years, the U.S. founding fathers were very interested in Sparta. They had all read um, the ancient histories uh, in Greek and Latin about the Spartans, and uh, they admired Sparta uh, very, very much. And so the complex structure of our government, to some extent, is based on the political system in Sparta, and also in Rome, as we will see. Um, Sparta was very interesting also in terms of how its women uh, lived. Because, like I said, in most of Greece, women were very oppressed, downtrodden, their lives were very limited. But in Sparta, you know, the men were actually away most of the time, uh, fighting wars or milita military camps training. And that meant that the women had to have more freedom because essentially they had to do a lot of the business of the city uh, that would normally fall to uh, the men, such as uh, trading and buying and, and, and selling things and so forth. And so Spartan women had a lot more freedom than other Greek women. They, they had to because essentially they had to run things in the absence of their males. Um, and Spartan women were famous for their um, toughness. Uh, it's kind of a famous saying, so supposedly whenever a Spartan boy would go off for the first time to fight in um, a war, his mother would say to him, son, come back with your shield or on it. <laughs> come back with your shield or on it. What did that mean? Well, if you look at the picture, um, ancient Greek warfare uh, was carried out by soldiers known as hoplites. And they were called that because of the big shield they all carried, which was called a hoplon. And each hoplite would also carry a long um, spear, and they would get together, uh, form together in a large square formation, which was known as a phalanx. And they would all advance together against the enemy, holding up their shields and holding out their spears um, in an attempt to overrun the enemy. Uh, it all, <laughs> the phalanx almost looked like a giant porcupine, <laughs> you know, with its quills. Uh, sticking out, but it was a very effective method of um, warfare, uh, and the shield was very important. So what was what were the Spartan mothers saying to their sons? Well, essentially they were saying, look, son, if you come back to Sparta, you better have that shield with you, okay? Because if you dropped your shield, that would mean that you were a coward who ran away from the battle. Uh, so the mothers were saying essentially, look, you better bring back that shield with you. If not, I'd rather have you come back on your shield, that is, dead, carried on your shield, rather than have you come back as a coward. <laughs> because uh, if you were a coward in Sparta, you were, uh, you were nothing. You were shunned, you were ostracized um, because of that Spartan warrior uh, code. The other great city-state, of course, is... Um, Athens. Um, Athens' political history is um, fascinating, as is their cultural history. They were very different from Sparta in a lot of ways. They were a military power, but they also had a, they had a more rich cultural and artistic life um, than the Spartans did. They also had a more cosmopolitan culture with more people from other countries coming in and out of Athens. Um, trading and so forth. But you'll actually read about this in your second document on ancient Greece, um, which is a speech given by the great uh, Athenian politician Pericles, um, as reported in a book by the historian uh, Thucydides. So you'll read more about Athens and its unique qualities in the speech by uh, Pericles. Right now I want to talk about the political changes in Athens. Essentially, Athens ran through almost all of uh, Aristotle's six forms of government during their history. They started out in 621 BC with their first law code that was drafted by a man named um, Draco. And this law code was very, very strict. Uh, the, there were a lot of capital crimes, that is, uh, crimes that were punishable by death. And so even today, sometimes if, if um, if Congress, for instance, passes a very strict law, you might read online or in a newspaper that a, it's a draconian law. Uh, in other words, very strict, very harsh. Um, 
But under Draco's law code, Athens was ruled by noble families who took turns um, in the major public office, the office of the Archon. Um, and so Athens in this early period was an aristocracy ruled by the nobility. However, very soon the people of Athens got tired of Draco's very strict law code, and they asked another man named Solon in 594 BC to create a new law code. And so under Solon's code, um, he opened up access to the high offices in Athens to people based on wealth. Um, and so you see that uh, Athens is now transformed from an aristocracy into an oligarchy. 34 years after that, in 560 BC, a man named Paesistratus rode into Athens one day with the goal of making himself uh, the ruler of Athens, which he did, um, mainly because he was able to get a lot of allies and a lot of support from the lower classes by promising them lots of things. And so Paesistratus became a tyrant, and Athens now has become um, a tyranny. Um, Piusistratus died in 528 BC. He was succeeded by his son um, Hippias. Hippias had a brother named Hipparchus. In 514 BC, BC, Hipparchus, the brother of the tyrant of Athens, was murdered by two men named Harmodius and Aristogaeton. <laughs> and you see in those sculptures there, they were considered heroes throughout Greece, the tyrant killers. Uh, they were celebrated in songs and, and works of art, okay? But it's very, very interesting the motive why Harmodius and Aristogaeton killed Hipparchus. It had to do with the fact that Hipparchus had, well, Harmodius and Aristogaeton were male lovers. And Hipparchus had made a pass and wanted to sleep with uh, the younger of the two lovers. And so uh, the older one, uh, got the younger lover, Aristogaeton, to help him murder Hipparchus, uh, which, which they did. And that leads us into the very interesting topic of Greek homosexuality. Uh, the Greeks had almost a unique <laughs> approach to homosexuality in human history. In fact, it, it, you could almost say that their whole society was built on um, male homosexuality as a practice because in ancient Greek culture, it was very typical if you were a teenage male that you would be initiated into manhood by an older male lover. Typically, these couples, you know, so you, the, the, the younger man might be 16, 17, 18, the older one maybe in his late 30s or early 40s. Um, these relationships were not always sexual relationships, but often they were, and they were always um, very intense and very um, emotional. Um, furthermore, um, <laughs> so, in a sense, what, what you see in ancient Greece is that homosexuality for many men was a rite of passage into adult manhood. Furthermore, um, it was not considered to be a permanent, lifelong situation. You know, modern day gay activists consider homosexual, for by and large, consider homosexuality to be a permanent um, state. Uh, many times people will say that, that, that they were born into this, this was my nature, you know, in a sense, as part of my DNA, um, etc. And it's lifelong and you can't change it. That's the typical modern belief about homosexuality. Um, the Greeks had a very different view because, in a sense, they went into and out of homosexuality based on uh, their age uh, and their state in life. So, so typically, as a teenage male, you'd have this older male lover. Then, in your early 20s, you would normally uh, marry a woman, and you would have children um, with your wife. 
And then uh, when the children were grown or nearly grown and you were, you know, say about 40, then you would take a younger male lover and initiate him into manhood. This was um, a very, very typical pattern um, throughout Greece and um, including uh, Sparta, uh, as you'll see in the reading by Plutarch. Uh, so I think this tells us really how powerful um, culture is in terms of our um, behavior. You know, we do a lot of things um, in our day-to-day -day life simply because our culture tells us that um, that that is the thing to do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so this system may seem very different to us because it's not the way that things are typically done in our society, but um, in ancient Greece it was considered to be normal. And in fact, uh, if I mean, not everyone participated in this, but if you were a teenage male and you didn't participate, the other kids might think that you were kind of weird. <laughs> so there was even, you could say, a peer pressure or expectation um, that you would uh, take on this rite of passage through homosexual um, behavior. Um, so again, uh, culture is very, very, very powerful. I think that um, the Greek approach to homosexuality was also very much related to the the Greek men and their view of um, women. Like I said, women were supposed to stay home. They weren't supposed to go out of the house on their own. They were not allowed to own property except for their own clothing, their own jewels, and um, slaves also. So women would kind of boss their slaves around, but that was almost the only power they had. They were not even allowed to live separately on their own. Um, so if you got married and your husband died, you had to go back and live with your dad or, or your brother because you had to have um, a male guardian. Um, uh, I guess about 25 years ago now, a book came out um, by the historian uh, Sarah Pomeroy. The title of it was Goddesses, Whores, Wives, and Slaves. It was about Greek women. And Pomeroy's point was that if you were in ancient Greece and you were a woman, those were the only options. You were either a goddess, uh, a prostitute, a wife, or a slave. <laughs> there were no other um, options. Um, and so when you think about that, you know, even though Greek men would marry women in order to have children, they really looked down on women. And so it was not surprising that these relationships with other males became their emotional um, center. After all, they simply didn't think women were very important or very interesting or even very beautiful. The ideal of beauty in ancient Greece was the nude male form and, and, and um, many, many statues of ancient Greece uh, and other artworks have come down to us to, uh, to support that. Um, I do want to talk about one woman in Greece who broke the mold in a way and was able to carve out a, a more independent life for herself. Her name was Sappho, and she lived approximately from 620 to 550 BC on the island of Lesbos, an island off the coast of Greece in the Aegean Sea. And Sappho, uh, her emotional um, preference was for uh, women and sexual preference, and she wrote many beautiful love poems um, to other uh, women. Um, she's almost the only lesbian we know of from ancient Greece. Uh, and in fact, that term lesbian comes from the island of Lesbos, where, um, where Sappho lived, uh, because she was almost the only woman in ancient Greece who actually um, recorded um, a lesbian uh, lifestyle in her, in her uh, poetry. All right, so back to the political system in Athens. Well, anyway, after the death of his brother Hipparchus, the tyrant uh, Hippias became very uh, angry and very harsh and very cruel to his people uh, in revenge for the death of his brother. And by 510 BC, the uh, Athenians were very tired of that. And so they invited the Spartans to come and help them to overthrow their tyrant um, Hippias, uh, which the Spartans did. Well, in the struggle, a new leader emerged in Athens. His name was Cleisthenes. And um, Cleisthenes believed that uh, the more ordinary people of Athens, not the nobility, not necessarily the rich, but 
all the free male citizens should have some say in the government. And so it was really under Cleisthenes' leadership that Athens began to become a democracy. That, ju that term just is Greek, and it just means government by the people. Um, one of the reforms, the democratic reforms that was instituted by Cleisthenes, was the practice of ostracism. Um, so once a year, all of the free male citizens of Athens would get together in the agora, and they would all be given a small broken piece of pottery called an ostracon. And on the ostracon, they would scratch the name of someone that they felt was dangerous, who needed to be sent into exile, that is, kicked out of Athens for a 10-year period so that he would not cause trouble. Uh, in the picture on the bottom right, you see an ostracon where someone has scratched the name of the Athenian general Themistocles, who is, by the way, the hero of the second 300 movie, if you've seen it. <laughs> um, but Themistocles was ostracized. He was sent out of Athens for 10 years because he was believed to be dangerous. Uh, so this practice of ostracism was meant to give more power to the people, to get rid of people uh, who were believed to be enemies to the common folks, um, and to send them into exile. But we still use this term uh, today, uh, like for instance, if a teenager in high school is shunned by his or her peers or maybe bullied, uh, sometimes people will say, well, well, he or she was ostracized. All right, but um, you know, Greece was not really uh, a major power in the Mediterranean world at the beginning. How did it become so? Well, it had to do with a conflict that the Greeks had with the major superpower uh, in the 6th century BC, Persia, the Persian um, Empire, which was um, expanding. So by 546 BC, the Persians had conquered all of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and they were in the process of taking over the Greek colonies along the coast of Asia Minor and also on the islands of Ionia uh, off the coast of Asia Minor. And, and they did. But in 499 BC, some of those Ionian Greek colonies decided to revolt against Persian dominance. And they naturally sent messengers back to Greece, to the mainland, asking for help. Uh, after all, Greece was the mother country. Uh, well, the Spartans refused to help. <laughs> they knew how to pick their battles, and they didn't want to go up against the Persian Empire. But the Athenians uh, offered to help the Ionian colony of Miletus uh, in their resistance to Persia, and so they sent over soldiers and sailors uh, to help Miletus. And in 498 BC, the Athenians, the Athenians, together with the Miletans, attacked and looted and sacked the city of Sardis, the Persian city of Sardis. Well, uh, the Persian emperor Darius was very humiliated by that and extremely um, angry, and he really wanted revenge against Athens. In fact, uh, Herodotus, the great Greek historian, said that he had a slave, but the emperor Darius had a slave whose job was to stand next to the emperor at meals and whisper in his ear three times, Master, remember the Athenians. <laughs> so Darius would not forget about how angry he was with the Athens and how he wanted to punish them. And so in order to punish the Athenians, the upstart Athenians in 490 BC, the emperor Darius of Persia sent over an army of 20,000 seasoned Persian troops that landed near Athens on the plain of Marathon. Well, um, obviously the Athenians were aware of this and they were scared to death, so they decided to ask the Spartans for help. Um, and so they selected their most, uh, uh, their, their best runner, Phidippides, to run to Sparta, which was 75 miles away from Athens, to ask for help. Believe it or not, because of the mountains, this was the fastest way to get from Athens um, to Sparta rather than, say, riding a horse. Uh, it was actually faster to run. Well, anyway, Phidippides took off and ran to Sparta and asked the Spartans for help. The Spartans said, well, um, gosh, you know, we really would love to help, but 
we're having a religious festival right now. Can you please come back in a few weeks? <laughs> and we might consider it. Ah, well, Pheidippides was disappointed. Um, and so he, dis he headed back to Athens with the bad news. And uh, he made it to the plain of Marathon, where the battle was already underway. And this battle was, astonishingly, a great victory for the Athenians. The Athenians just wiped the floor with the Persians. They killed 6,400 of the 20,000 Persian soldiers and lost only 192 of their own men in this great victory at the Battle of Marathon. And uh, they were, of course, very excited and they wanted to send the good news to Athens. Uh, so they asked for a volunteer to run to Athens, 26.2 miles from Marathon to Athens to bring the good news of the victory. Well, Pheidippides stepped forth and volunteered, and he took off and he ran the 26.2 miles, and that, of course, was the first marathon. <laughs> and when Pheidippides completed the first marathon and he entered the city of Athens, he held up his arms and he shouted, Nikomen, which means, we have won. And then Pheidippides dropped dead on the spot. <laughs> And that was the sad end of the first marathon, the first 26.2 mile race. Uh, Pheidippides, worn out from all of his running over the past few days, uh, dropped dead uh, right there in the streets of Athens, having taken them the good news of the Athenian victory. Well, uh, now you can imagine the mighty Persian Empire was even more humiliated, having been defeated by this tiny city-state in Greece. Um, Darius died. He was succeeded in 486 BC by his son, the Emperor Xerxes. And the Emperor Xerxes, on behalf of his father, vowed an even stronger revenge against the Athenians. But if you want to find out what happened in the next phase of the Persian Wars, um, you'll have to wait until Ancient Greece lecture, video lecture number two. <laughs> Well, we'll leave that for now. I will just say that it was this uh, first Persian War that really propelled Greece onto the world stage as a potential uh, superpower. So to see how that played out, uh, please watch the video lecture Ancient Greece number two.